We're so thankful for your presence. And we ask that as we assemble tonight, that we might have the joy of your companionship. And we're so thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. You know, it's a blessing each time we have the privilege of opening the Word of God. Amen. I look forward to this time together. And I'm so thankful that as we enter into another night, as we continue in our series of working for the night is coming, I believe that we can begin to sense an urgency. I believe that each one of us should have an urgency in our minds, and our hearts, that everything we have should be consecrated to the work of God. What do you say? Uh, I want to mention a few things before we start this evening. And the first is, I, I hope that you've brought Bibles. Amen? In fact, that you, if you brought Bibles, if you just raise them up, so I'd like to see those Bibles. And it looks good to see how many of you have come and stepped forward with us in the front. Amen? There's a special blessing for those who sit uh, in those seats. So I'm thankful for those Bibles. What about pen and paper? You brought pen and paper. We know that we want to take notes with those pen and paper. We're going to study some things that I know that you would never have seen in your life. Others that you can write down and make sure you have the text. We want to make sure that everything we believe is based not on what a man says, not on what a church says, but everything we believe, we should make sure that it's based upon the word of God. Amen? Now, and I gave you a challenge. I, I hope you don't think I forgot about that challenge. I can see some of you are saying, oh, I hope you forgot. No, I didn't forget about that challenge. In fact, I can see that some of you have been taking that challenge. You're shaking. Amen. <laughs> that withdrawal is going on. You remember the challenge? Anybody remember what the challenge was? What was the challenge? Three nights. Three nights, three days of no what? No screens. I wonder how many took the challenge. Amen. Praise God. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand tonight. I may put you on the spot tomorrow night. Uh, but I'm not going to ask you to do that tonight. Amen. But I pray that every one of you will take the challenge. You, you remember what we studied and we found that no one who is addicted to the media is going to be ready for the coming of Jesus. I promise you there's no one who is addicted to any media that is going to be ready for the coming crisis that is going to take place. And so if we're going to be ready, that addiction must be broken before the crisis starts. In other words, the addiction must be broken now. And so we said three nights, and every night, I'm going to remind you because I want, the, every time you see that television, I want it to be an advertisement for God and for these meetings. Now you remember, that, that minister said, take and cut this off. You know, we need to cut off televisions and open up Bibles. We've got to come back to the Word of God and to the words of Jesus if we're going to be ready to meet Him, if we're going to experience a revival and reformation. Now, a man said, no, I'm not addicted. You know, the best way to prove that you're not addicted to something is to demonstrate that you can give it up. Amen? The cocaine addict says he's not addicted to cocaine. But when he starts stealing through his mother's purse and stealing in his mother's purse the money that is needed, then he recognizes that he is an addict, that he can't stop. And so, my brothers and sisters, if you believe that you are not addicted to the media, then you have two nights more to prove it. Amen? And then, as I said last night, when we get to the end of that third night, then I will bargain some more. Amen? And so I plead that each one of us would take that challenge. And if God takes something away like television or the internet, God never takes something away without replacing it with something better. Amen? And so we notice that once he's taken away the media, in its place, he's given us the principles of the word of God. I gave you notes last night. If you took notes, you have enough notes, and we're going to make sure that every night you get enough notes, enough from the Bible to study and to look over and to examine that you may understand for yourself the things that we're studying are real. This is not fiction. The world cannot continue much longer. Then in Bahamas, things are getting ready to change. I told you that we are in a time of change, and change is blowing on every continent. It's blowing in every country. It's blowing in every church and community. And this change is getting ready to produce a terrible storm. You know that the most violent storm seasons always come at a time of change. Am I right or wrong? That anywhere in the world where there is subject to environmental change, that the greatest storm seasons always are in the fall of the year or in the spring of the year. Why is this? 
Because in the spring of the year, the weather is changing from winter to what? To summer. In the fall of the year, such as what we're in now, the weather is changing from the summer to the winter. And as a result of that, it produces a change. And that change in the season produces some of the most violent storms. And my brothers and sisters, we're getting ready to see religious changes. We're getting ready to see political changes that is going to produce a storm that unless we know Jesus, we can never go through it. And so this is why these meetings are here. And I pray that every one of us would prepare ourselves and say, Lord, I'm not going to let anything keep me from making it to every night of these meetings. Every time these meetings are going on, we should find ourselves present. Amen. Now, there may be some listening to the radio. Some people say that if you can't come, then listen to the radio. Well, I want to tell you, those who are listening on the radio, if you are listening to the radio and you have legs to be here, you need to be here the next time this meeting is here. Amen. I'm telling that for those who are listening on the radio. Amen. I want to see you tomorrow. I want to see you tonight. Those who are listening on the radio. But for those of us that is here, nothing should stop us. Let's t- it's time to get ready for the coming of Jesus. What do you say? Now, there were those that asked about materials. There will be DVDs and CDs and books available that will allow you to study this message. We have a lot to cover. I'm telling you, in just three days, we're just touching the surface. It normally takes even a week just to begin to lay the foundation of what we're studying. We need every minute. Are you ready to study, brothers and sisters? And so before we get into the meeting tonight, you know it would be foolish to think that we could study the Bible without prayer. It's almost as foolish to get into the car without prayer. You know, I'm afraid to drive with a man that is confident to drive before he prays. You know, every time I get in the car and if the man doesn't do it with me, I make sure I do it. Amen. Because I know that the devil is intent upon trying to kill us. The moment you hear what we're going to study, you become a target of the devil. And so I plead, don't get on these highways. Don't get on these dangerous highways without pleading and praying with God. That God will protect you from, before you go from point A to point B. Amen. And I believe the same way when we open the word of God that we should ask God's presence to be with us. So we said that as our custom will be, that every night we want to spend how many minutes in prayer? Two minutes in prayer. Is that a long time? No, that's a very short time. In fact, man talks on his cell phone much longer than two minutes. That little boy talking to his little girlfriend talks much longer than two minutes. But when you don't know somebody, two minutes seems like a long time. But when you know Jesus, two minutes is not a long time at all. So I plead that as we get ready to get into the message tonight, we're going to study tonight into a subject that we have entitled the science of prophecy. But before we study that subject this evening, we want to spend two minutes in prayer. So if you would reverently kneel with me, we want to approach the Lord in prayer. Oh, come, let us kneel. Let us bow down before the Lord, our maker. And after two minutes of silent prayer, We'll close that out loud from up front and we'll get into the message, the science of prophecy. Let's ask for the Holy Spirit. Forget everybody else and say, Lord, do something for my heart tonight. Pour out your spirit. O Father, which art in heaven, the creator of heaven and earth and sea, the Redeemer of all mankind. Why do you love us so much, O God? When we have ignored you, when we have put the world before you, why is it that your love is still poured out toward us? What is man that you are so mindful of us, that you visit us day by day? Lord, we're thankful, even though we don't understand it, we're thankful tonight that there is redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. O oh, Father, I plead with thee tonight that you will break the hold of Satan upon this island. This island that has been the stronghold of the enemy, I plead that you will make it a battlefield for Jesus Christ. A boot camp that can train soldiers that can finish your work in this last generation. Teach us, Lord, that we must work for the night is coming. O oh, Father, I plead in a special way that you would show us the significance of having an audience chamber with you. 
We're living in a time, Lord, when men would stand in line to talk to kings and queens. That man would, that they would spend hours just waiting in line to get a picture with rap stars and reggae artists and different others. But Lord, we're living in a time when the God of the universe, the King of Kings, has given us the privilege of having an uh, unannounced interview with you. And Lord, how few of us take advantage of it. And the angels wonder why it is that we pray so little. I plead, Lord, that you will cause us to begin to pray like we've never prayed before. I plead for the power of God, Lord, to sanctify this building, this building that may have been used for unholy practices, that you will sweep it of demonic influence. If there's been any spirit that we have brought in through compromise, through the ways of the world, we plead that angels that excel in strength will escort them out of this room and that only the presence of holy angels will be felt in this assembly. We pray that even those that pass by will feel the sanctifying presence of God and will be drawn to want to come and see the words of the life. We plead, Lord, that you remove every distraction, that you will steal the babies, that you will cause our minds to be attentive, and that you will allow us to sit in the very presence of Jesus Christ. Change us, Lord. And now and abide with us, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Soldiers of the cross. Would you please join me? Every round goes higher and higher. Every round goes higher and higher. Every round goes higher and higher. Oh, Father, we're so thankful that there's a ladder that reaches from earth to heaven, that reaches us where we are and brings us to heavenly places. Now grant us the Spirit of God as we open your word. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will take your Bibles and turn to the book of John, to the fourth book of the New Testament, to the Gospel of John chapter 14. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. John chapter 14. You see, brothers and sisters, we're living in a day and hour where Satan has caused many to doubt in the existence of God. He has created infidelity. He has created skepticism. The devil has created atheism who doubt in the existence of God and in the Word of God. But God has a way of making a believer out of us. In fact, notice what the Bible says in John 14. Notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 29. We all have Bibles. Let's look at them. We have a Bible? You have a Bible? We got to bring those Bibles. Amen. Let's let's, let's look at those Bibles. John 14 beginning in verses 29. All of us want to see what the Bible says beginning in verse 29. You're there, amen? Look what the Bible says in verse 29. Let's read that together. The Bible says, And now I do what? I have told you before it come to pass. That when it is come to pass, you might do what? You might believe. So notice now what Jesus is saying. Jesus said to us, I tell you before it come to pass. Now tell me, what is that? Past, present, or future? Before it come to pass, is that past, present, or future? Well, that's future. The Bible says, I'm going to tell you some things in the future. I'm going to give you prophecy. And I'm going to give you prophecy before it takes place. He said, I'm going to tell you before it come to pass... That when it is come to pass, what is that? Past, present, or future. When it has come to pass. Why, that's past. In other words, Jesus is telling us, I'm going to tell you some things in the future. I'm going to give you prophecy. 
And when you see it take place in the present and it becomes history, then you can believe my word. I mean, think of it. If a man tells you what is going to take place before it happens, it lets you have confidence in his word. Does it make sense? And so the Bible says that Jesus said that prophecy was the foundation of the faith of Christ. And I read where a prophet wrote in the book Evangelism. Page 196, Messenger to the Remnant says that ministers should present the sure word of prophecy. Of what? Of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of seven-day Adventists. We're told that seven-day Adventists are to present prophecy as the foundation of their faith. Why? Because seven-day Adventists are Christians. And a Christian is someone who is like Jesus. And if prophecy is the foundation of Jesus, then if we are Christians, prophecy must be our foundation. Does it make sense? We're told that we should present the prophecies as the foundation of our faith and the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation should be carefully studied. And in connection with them, the words, Behold the Lamb of God. Who's that? Jesus. That prophecy must be combined with Jesus, an uplifted Savior, and as a result, we would see both revival and reformation. You see, the devil hates prophecy. And the reason why is because prophecy gives us the ability to believe in Jesus. If God's prophecies are true in the word of God, then everything else that God said must be true. And so if the word is true, then no matter how sinful I am, if I come to Jesus, there is salvation. No matter how many problems I have, if the word of God is true, I have a God that can supply all of my need. And so the only thing that the devil can do to destroy us is to tear away faith in the word of God. And so what has God given us? Even the atheist can understand this. The Bible says, I tell you, before it come to pass, so that when it come to pass, you might believe. And my brothers and sisters, Jesus has told us what is going to take place in these last days. And Jesus doesn't tell us what the politicians say. Oh, Jesus tells the truth. You see, the politicians, many of them will tell you things are getting ready to get better. And you believe what the politician says. You believe the religious leader. You believe him when he says that just because the roads are getting larger here in Bahamas. That because the buildings are becoming more prominent. That because there are more urbanization and less country, because you have more business, because all these things seem to be building, the, 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 the world will tell you that things are getting ready to get better and you're going to be here forever because you have a big beach that looks like the water goes forever. Maybe we will go forever, but my friends, there is a limit. And I don't care where we are, who we are, if we believe the word of God, this world cannot exist forever. And while the politicians and the religious leaders may tell us that there's going to be peace, there's going to be safety, there's going to be glamour, there's going to be prosperity, Jesus says a storm is coming. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew, what book did I say? Matthew chapter 16, turn only there. In Matthew 16, Jesus talks about this coming storm. You see, Jesus is a preacher that is going to tell us the truth. And do you know that if mankind would only understand the love of God on one hand, if we understood how much Jesus loves us, and on the other hand, if we understood the great crisis that is going to break upon every nation, if we understood the time of trouble that is getting ready to burst upon this last generation, many would stop playing games with God. We have a generation today that is playing games with God. We've been told that if you just go to a church, it doesn't matter what denomination, that if you just go to a church, that if you just pay tithe to that church, that if you just make a profession of Christianity, that that means you're going to be safe and you're going to be saved. But my brothers and sisters, no one is going to be ready for this coming storm unless he has a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't care what denomination you belong to. The only thing that's going to save us is not our religious connection, not our religious affiliation. The only thing that is going to save us is our affiliation with Jesus. My brothers and sisters, God has men and women that love him in every denomination. But let me tell you something, only those that know Jesus are going to be ready for the coming crisis. And the Bible says that this storm is getting ready to break. Oh, Jesus tells us about this coming storm. 
In Matthew 16, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Matthew 16, beginning in verse 2, here is Jesus talking to some religious leaders. In verses 2, the Bible says, let's read that together. It says, he answered and said unto them, when it is evening, you say what? It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. Now listen, let me tell you something about the time of Christ. You see, in the time of Christ, they had come to the place where they could look at the color of the sky. They could look at the formation of the clouds, and by looking at the color of the sky and the formation of the clouds, they could predict or foretell what the weather was going to be like at that day. And Jesus took this everyday experience as an object lesson, and he used it to teach deep spiritual truths that present present truth for his day. And you'll find that the same lessons that was present true for the days of Christ are present true for us today. In fact, the Bible says in verse 3, it says, And in the morning it will be what? Foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Notice Jesus. O ye hypocrites, actors, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the what? The signs of the times. Jesus said, you can look at the color of the sky. You can look at the formation of the clouds. You have all of this ability to see what's coming, and yet you cannot discern the signs of the times. And I believe that you and I, in this day, with all of our so-called advanced technology, are just like those in the time of Christ. I believe we have our radar machines and our Doppler machines, and we can predict where earthquakes are coming. We can tell when tornadoes are blistering and blowing. We can foretell when hurricanes are going to take place. And man, with all of this advanced technology, can foresee coming storms on the earth. And yet, we still cannot see the signs of the times. We still don't know that a prophetic storm is getting ready to blow upon every nation. And we're not ready. You see, my friends, Jesus said we must understand the signs. And we studied last night that ever since sin into the world, that the Bible says that the world could not exist forever, that there would be a limit to how long this world would last. And God does not leave us in darkness of when that limit would be reached. In fact, you remember the disciples came to Jesus on the Mount of Olives and they came to him privately and they said, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus gave them clear signs to mark what would be the limit generation, the last generation. And he said, when you see this, know that it is near, even at the... And then Jesus said, I'm going to let you know what that means. It means that this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. And we're going to prove that you and I are that generation. In fact, brothers and sisters, Jesus has given us every ability to know what is going to transpire. And we found out what that sign was. We found out that that sign that the world had reached its limit was the passing of a national Sunday law. We found that everyone in the world sees Sunday laws coming. We found out that that Sunday law is going to take place. We found out that there was a limit. We found out that that limit would be reached. It says, God keeps a record with the nations. The figures are swelling against them in the books of heaven. And when it shall have become a what? A law that the transgression of the first day of the week. What's the first day of the week? Sunday. That when there is going to be a law, a Sunday law, it says the transgression of the first day of the week shall be met with punishment. Then their cup will be For or the limit will be reached this far and and no further. That's the last generation. My brothers and sisters, the prophet tells us in volume 7, page 141, that the earth has almost reached the place where God will permit the destroyer to work his will upon it. The substitution of the laws of what? Men for the law of God. The exaltation by merely what? Human authority of Sunday in place of the, what type of Sabbath? You see, brothers and sisters, there are only two types of Sabbath. One is the Sunday Sabbath of tradition, and the other is the biblical seven-day Sabbath, not of seven-day Adventists, but of the Bible. You see, brothers and sisters, it's amazing that there are many Christians in every denomination. 
People who love God. And they believe, sincere Christians believe that Sunday is the Bible Sabbath. And so we go all around the world teaching what the Bible says. And we always say, if there's any text in the Bible that would prove that Sunday is the Lord's Day, that Sunday is the Bible Sabbath or the Christian Sabbath or anything such like that that says that we should worship on that day, then show us one text because a Christian is somebody that is like Jesus. And Jesus said, man shall not live by tradition. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And there are many Christians that do not know. They have never studied the Bible for themselves. They believe that Sunday is the Bible Sabbath. But when you challenge someone to let them study for themselves, they go back to the Bible and they find out that there's no text. I'll never forget I was in the States doing some meetings like this, and we were sitting uh, at the table, stayed with a man who was a Baptist minister, had a big, big grounds that we were using. We were renting his facility, and we were there, and we stayed at his house, and we were having good conversations. It was a multi-millionaire Baptist minister, and we were there talking, and we started talking about health, and he said, oh, I, I, I like the fact that you understand health from the Bible, and he started talking about that, and we were talking about the wonders of Bible health and how to be restored physically, and then... After a while of talking, he said, everything you say about health is true. I need this myself. And we helped him with it. And then he said, but tell me this. Why do you go to church on the wrong day? And I said, listen, I didn't bring it up, but I'm not afraid to talk about it. And so I said, listen, I am a man who believes in the word of God. I don't put my church above the Bible. I don't put what a church says above the Bible. You see, I couldn't be a Christian. I must put God first. I must put the Bible first. This is the position of a Christian. I said, if any man could show me in the Bible which day that God said to worship on, I would do it because I'm not wedded to man. I'm wedded to Jesus. Man didn't die for me. Jesus died for me. And so, brothers and sisters, we went back to the Bible and I said, just show me one text. That minister said, oh, it's there. I'm a minister. I'm a Baptist minister. It's there. I said, just show me one and I'll be happy to preach it all the way around the world. He said, okay, I'll show it to you. And the minister went upstairs. And he didn't come down that night. And the next day, he didn't bring up the subject anymore. You know why? Because the text is not in the Bible. I'm going to show you tonight where it came from. In fact, brothers and sisters, this says the earth has almost reached the place where God will permit the destroyer to work his will upon it. The substitution of the laws of men for the law of God. The exaltation by merely human authority of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the what? Last act in the drama. In other words, brothers and sisters, the thing that's going to show us that the world has reached the limit is when man has the audacity to put his commandments in the place of the commandments of God. To put his Sabbath in the place of God's Sabbath. This is going to be the sign that the limit has been reached and God says this far and no further. My brothers and sisters, it says when this substitution becomes universal, God will reveal himself. Somebody says, no, there's no way in the world that Sunday laws will come to the world. But yesterday we showed you that any man that has intelligence knows that Sunday is coming. Not just the religionists. Man may be an atheist, he knows Sunday law is coming. Man may be a politician, he knows Sunday law is coming. Every denomination knows that Sunday laws is coming, but they don't know what it means. I showed you last night where the newspapers right around America said, why isn't what? Sunday special anymore? For a lot of Americans, it's just another day. You have to go to work. We saw in USA Today, 2008, it says Sunday shopping ban where? In Croatia. The Croatian parliament has passed a law. Forcing shops to close when? On Sundays in concession to the Roman Catholic Church. This is the, not a religious newspaper. This is just a world newspaper. We found out in Europe, same thing. We found out in Germany, same thing. We found out all around the world, Sunday laws are coming. All the way in America, 2008, Oregon, all those dealers won a what? Sunday's off law. Everywhere you turn, you see Sunday laws coming. And this is one of the most shocking. 
Here is an official website of Israel News. Here is Jewish life. And everyone knows that the Jews themselves know what day does the Jew say is the Sabbath. The seventh day is the Sabbath. That's what the Jew says. The world says that it's Jewish, not biblical. And it's biblical, but the world says it's Jewish. But notice now, even in Israel, as of 2011, it says the government to consider adding what? Sunday as a day of rest. Now, my brothers and sisters, if that would take place in Israel, you know what would happen in Bahamas. If that would take place in Israel, you know what's going on in America. My friends, Sunday laws are getting ready, and this is going on right now. This is 2012. Sunday's off. This is 2012. It says Sunday's off. Is it good for the Jews? My friend, this is coming. CNN told us the same thing. We looked at this. We saw that Fox News told us the same thing. Fox News says 2012. You see, something is happening in 2012, and we must study through prophecy to understand what's taking place here. I'm going to tell you something. When that Sunday law is passed, it is going to be too late for seven-day Adventists to get ready. We don't know that today. You see, there are many Christians that believe that Sunday is the Sabbath and God is a loving God, a merciful God, an honest God, and God will not cast judgment upon them until every person has an opportunity to hear for himself and to study the word of God for themselves and to do what it says. The Bible says that ignorance God winks at it in Acts 17. 30 and 31, but then it says in James 4, 17, but to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, the Bible says to him it is, it's sin. And so my brothers and sisters, we're told in the Bible that judgment is going to begin at the house of God. My friends, Sunday is coming and it's going to mean something very significant. It says let's make Sunday a day of rest. You cannot be intelligent and believe that Sunday laws are not coming. It's all over the world. And somebody says, but it's not in the Bahamas. Is that what you say? I have some papers right now. A friend of mine, friend of mine just, just handed me some papers today. I've been researching it. In your state legislator, they talk about these Sunday shops closing. In fact, I have some papers, we'll probably show it before it's over with, where in the 1990s that there was a great legislation trying to bring Sunday to close in the Bahamas, but it was held back, and we're going to see why, because something had to happen in 2008, and we have to study this. You see, brothers and sisters, it wasn't time yet because God knew that his people were not ready and God has been holding back the winds of strife, but he can hold those winds forever. You know why? Because there's a limit to the forbearance of Jehovah. And so it says here, and this Sunday is coming. In fact, notice what it says. It says, this is an invitation to Jews, to Hindus, to Muslims, to atheists, to agnostics, to Buddhists, to Christians. They said, let's make one day a week and have it for rest. In other words, they said, for all the world, we must make Sunday a day of rest. And it's going to take place. And the question is, are you ready for it? Am I ready for it? This is why these meetings are taking place, to prepare us for what is soon to take place. You see, my friends, we must work. You know why? For the night is coming. Look at what the prophet says, 2012. I believe in 2012. We're just a few short months to a few short years away from the passing of this national Sunday law. And a test is going to be brought at this time. We have just a little time left. And do you know, we're hearing nothing about this all the way around the world. The devil is trying to mute this message of warning. Why? Because he knows that there's only one church that has been given the light from heaven. And they are afraid to preach and practice what they profess to believe. It's time for a trumpet to be blown upon this island and to give the trumpet a certain sound. Listen, this says, time is what? Almost finished. Limit is almost reached. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? Then I was pointing to the earth and saw there would have to be a getting ready among those who have been laid embrace the what? Third angel's message. We're going to see what that is tonight. Said the angel, get ready, get ready, get ready. You have to die a greater death to the world than you have ever yet died. Now, would everybody read this part with me? Early writing 64, what does it say? I saw that there was a what? Great work to do for them and but what? 
little time in which to do it. Two things you wrote down in your paper last night. I pray you write it down again. Two things that it says. There is a what? Great work and but a what? Little time. This is why the whole series is titled Work for the Night is Coming. You remember what Jesus said in John 9 verse 4? Jesus said, I must work The works of him that sent me while it is day. Why? For the night cometh when no man can work. In other words, Jesus had a great work and a little time. And you and I today have a great work and a little time. Let me tell you something. That little time is going to bring us to the passing of this Sunday law. And you know what that great work is? Tell me. Do you know what the great work is? Anybody know what it is? It's right here on on the screen. Great work, little time. We know the little time is going to bring us to that Sunday law crisis. What about the great work? Because if you don't know what the work is, can you do the work? No, you can't. We need to know what the work is. Question. It's right here. Right on the sentence. Tell me. What do you? Let's read it. And tell me what it is. It first says, sentence says, time is what? What is that? Great work or little time? Which one is that referring to? Little time. Let's see about great work now. This says, do you reflect... The lovely image of Jesus, as you should. Question, what is the great word? To reflect the lovely image of who? I'm going to write down on the board two things. You know it. Great work. And what's the second thing? Little time. You should be writing that down. Little time. Now, in this great work, That great work is to look just like who? Jesus. What is the great work? The great work is to reflect his image, to look just like who? Now somebody says that's not a great work, but you tell me, is it a great work to make you look like Jesus? I don't know about you, but it's a great work to take this man and make me look just like Jesus. You see, to make a sinner look like the Savior is a great work that must be done in a little time we have, but a few short months to get this work right, where every word that we say, where every thought that we think, that every action that takes place in our life is nothing more than a manifestation of Jesus, that when somebody cuts us off on the road, instead of giving them the wrong parts of our mind, we're to give them Jesus. That when husband and wife get into some type of fight and fuss, that instead of conflict and fussing and cussing, the only thing that should come out is Jesus. That instead of the music of the world and the things of the world, instead of spending our time acting like the devil, we need to spend our time acting like Jesus. I tell you, Jesus would not watch the media that you and I watch today. You think that Jesus would spend time watching people take his name in vain. You think that Jesus will look at the soaps that that you shouldn't even call them a soap. It's so filthy. You think that Jesus will take the time to watch the fornication and the homosexuality that is being broadcast all over the media today. My friends, Jesus is of pure highs and to behold evil, the Bible says. You see, my friends, to take a sinner and make him look just like Jesus is going to take a revival and a reformation. To make us look just like Jesus. Somebody says that can never happen, that we can never look like Jesus. I'm going to tell you, if it can't happen, you will never receive the seal of God. If it doesn't happen, you will never be ready for the time of trouble and the coming of Jesus. In order to be saved, we must allow Jesus to restore his image in us. Somebody said he doesn't have enough power. You tell me, you mean to tell me Jesus doesn't have enough power? You tell me what sin is more powerful than Jesus? There is not a sin. You show me the Bacardi and I'll show you the Savior. You show me the pack of cigarettes and I'll show you a man that died on Calvary to take away your sin. You show me the fornication and adultery and I will show you a man that can take a prostitute and make her an evangelist. You show me any sin and I'll show you a man that's greater than sin and his name is Jesus. My friends, this is why the devil doesn't want you to see Jesus. He would rather you get so busy putting your face in Facebook that you have no time to put your face in the book that is called the Bible. The only book that would show you the sweet face of Jesus and by beholding his face, we can become changed. My friends, listen. This is the great work, early writings, page 71. Look at what the prophet says. It says, I also saw that what? Many, not just a few, 
But many do not realize what they must what? Be. It's amazing. We sing about it, but we don't believe it. We say there's power in the blood. You remember that song? Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. Would you over evil a victory win? There is wonderful power in the blood. Why do we sing about it if we don't believe it? The Bible says that the gospel is the power of God and to salvation. So the apostle said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It can take a sinner and change from how do I know? Because it took a sinner like me and began to change me. It took the vices out of my hand and replaced it with a Bible. It took the motive of being a gangster and a thugger and a thug life. And it took it out of my heart and made me want to be an evangelist and a soldier winning souls for Jesus Christ. I know what the power of Jesus can do and he that begun that work, I want him to complete it and finish it that I may be prepared to stand but not alone. I want you to stand with me. And I believe there's some people right here on this island on Bahamas that is going to turn this island upside down once they hear the truth of God for these last days. You know why? Because we're sleeping right now. God has to wake us up. It says, I also saw that many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a what? High priest in the sanctuary through the time of what? We read that Michael is going to stand up in Daniel 12 verse 1. We read that there's going to be a time of trouble and in order to stand during the time of trouble, you must be just like Jesus. Brothers and sisters, listen to what this says. Let's read this. This is very important. Essential. This is the work it says, those who receive the what? Seal of the living God. Does the Bible speak of the seal? You remember in Revelation 6, the question is asked in the last verse, the great day of his wrath is come, who shall be able to stand? That's in Revelation 6, 17. Then the next chapter, Revelation 7, tells us that the only ones that are going to stand are those that have the seal of God, where? In their foreheads. And so it says that those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble, not might, but must. Must what? Reflect the image of Jesus just a little bit. What does fully mean? All the way. You mean to, you mean to tell me he can take a sinner and make him look just like Jesus? That is a great work. What do you say? But we have a Savior that can accomplish the work. What do you say? The Bible says, without, without me, you can do. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. So that work is to get us to look just like Jesus by the passing of a what? National Sunday law. Now, my brothers and sisters, early writing 67 says, but now time is what? Almost finished. And what we have been, what's that next two words? Years learning, those at the end of time. They will have to learn when? In a few months. I believe that we're in those few months right now. And we must study and prove it, my friends. This is why these meetings are so important. You can't let anything, not your job, not your school, not your play, nothing should keep you from being at these meetings. You should be here. Why? So that we can stand. Do you know that if you make an excuse and are lost at the end of time and you come to Jesus at the very end and Jesus says, how come you didn't surrender your heart? And you will say, well, I couldn't do it because I had to go to work. I didn't know that the crisis was coming. I didn't know that the time of trouble and the world was coming to an end. Do you know that Jesus wanted to say, how didn't you know I had a whole uh, weekend prepared for you, several days where you can come every night and study the word of God for yourself. And do you know that we will have no excuse? My brothers and sisters, God has given us a time. Listen, we have but a few months. This is no ordinary meetings. You may never here have an opportunity like this again. God is trying to speak to us before it is too late. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says they will also have much to unlearn and much to learn again. Now, somebody says, is that in the Bible that this is going to take place? Yes. Can you prove it? Yes. Look at the book of Revelation. What book did I say? Let's turn to the last book of the Bible. 
to the book of Revelation chapter 14. And we want to notice what the Bible says in Revelation 14. How do we know that the Sunday law is going to be that issue that is identifying that we reach the limit generation? The Bible says it many places, but in Revelation 14 is one great place. In Revelation 14, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Beginning in verse 6, the Bible tells us that this is not a message just for Seventh-day Adventists. This is a worldwide interdenominational message. In Revelation 14, beginning in verse 6, notice what the Bible says, and let's read that together. What does the Bible say? And I saw another angel. That word angel is just another word that means messenger. God said that there are going to be messengers in the last days. It says, I saw another angel or messenger fly in the midst of heaven, having the what? The everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell where? On the earth. And to where? Does that include Bahamas? Yes. To every nation and kindred and tongue and people. How many religions does that take in? How many atheists does that take in? God is so loving that God would not allow the world to come to an end. That God would not allow the time of trouble to start without first sending a message of warning to prepare every nation and kindred and tongue and people so that they would have opportunity to prepare for the coming storm. Now at the end of this everlasting gospel, these three angels, God points to the final scenes of this earth's history. He points to the last generation. In fact, look at verse 9 of Revelation 14. In fact, let's read it. Let's read verse, let's continue verse 7. Looking at that first angel, the first angel says, in verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment is come. In other words, this messenger would announce that judgment is in session. Then the Bible says, and worship him that did what? Not made the sun, just the sun. Don't worship the sun. It said, worship him that did what? Made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of water. In other words, this messenger would take the people away from worshiping the sun and would turn them back to worshiping the creator who were made the world in six days and rested on the seventh and gave them the Bible Sabbath of creation. And so the Bible says, then in the second angel would come into view. In verse 8, and it says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen. Is fallen. Now listen, Babylon represents the false churches. It represents the confused churches that are not living by the clear teachings of the word of God. They've accepted the traditions of men, and as a result, they are in religious confusion. And so the Bible says that Babylon is fallen and has made all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And tonight the world is intoxicated. The world today is not tipsy. The world is drunk with the wine of Babylon and is being handed out as bartenders to every church. Being handed out to every nation and man that does not study the word of God is deceived. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that even though the churches are confused, that the Bible teaches that God still has people in these confused churches? You go down to chapter 18, you will see that a message is given, the final message that says to Babylon, it's fallen. And then it says, come out of her, my people. God is going to have one fold and one shepherd as a result of following the word of God. But then the Bible tells us of the most threatening warning message ever sent to mankind. In verse 9, the Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, he didn't whisper. He said he didn't ask for permission from the government to speak this. He didn't ask permission from the church to speak this. With a loud voice, he said, if any man, I don't care what church he belongs to. I don't care if that man doesn't go to church anywhere in the world. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark 
in his forehead or in his hand, that same one, the Bible says in verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God poured out how? Without mixture. Now, let me make it plain so you don't misunderstand this. Listen to me. The world has never seen the wrath of God without mercy. Every calamity that has taken place since the creation of the world from the flood on down was always mixed and mingled with mercy and yet we've seen some terrible crises, have we not? We've seen some terrible storms, have we not? But all of those have been mixed with mercy. But do you know there used to be a song some years ago in the world, one rapper named Snoop Dogg, you don't know about him here in Bahamas, but one rapper named Snoop Dogg, he wrote a song called Sipping on Gin and Juice. And the reason why is because everybody knows that when you get some strong liquor, when you get some strong alcohol that you can't put down so easy like vodka, that you have to get something like gin and what you do, you take some orange juice and they would take orange juice and they would mix it with that terrible substance and as a result, it would dilute the strength of the mixture so that a man can drink it and still act like he has some sense although he's a fool just to put it in his body. I say a man's a fool to drink alcohol. The Bible says that wine is a mocker and beer, that those who drink from it are not wise. If you're not wise, then you're a fool. You see, the devil loves to make us look like a fool. And the way you know it is because when a man drinks, he starts acting like a fool. He starts talking like a fool. He starts walking like a fool and he starts acting like a fool. And this is why we have so much problem on the island today because we get so drunk. Am I right or wrong? And so, my friends, the Bible says that, that, that just as that mixture was to dilute the strength, the Bible says that when the wrath is poured out, the wrath of God is going not to be mixed. It is going to be what? Unmixed. In other words, it's going to be poured out in full strength. And God says, I don't want anyone to have to suffer the wrath of God. And then the seven last plagues and the destruction of hellfire. In fact, it says he shall be tormented with fire. Verse 10 and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And so the Bible says, I must send a warning before this takes place. And the Bible warns us against three things. How many things? Three things. You should write that down in your Bible. You should write that down in your notes. Three things. Look at what it says. It warns first, verse 9 said, that the third angel, verse 9, Revelation 14, the third angel warns us against worshiping the what? Against worshiping the beast. What else? Against worshiping the what? The image. The image of what? Just like the screen says, the image of the beast. And then it warns us against worshiping the third thing. What is that? The mark of the beast. So the third angel warns us against the worship of three things. It warns us against the worship of the beast. It warns us against the, again, warns us against the worship of the image of the beast. And it warns us against the worship of the mark of the beast. Now I want you to say that with me to make sure that we got it together. Repeat it with me. Third angel warns against three things. What are the three things? It warns against the worship of the beast. It, worship against the, it warns us against the worship of the image of the beast and then it, worship, it warns us against the worship of the mark of the beast and if you worship the beast his image is marked you shall receive the wine of the wrath of God now my friends I want you to notice that whether it's worshiping the beast or the image of the beast or the mark of the beast is all a worship of the beast does it make sense so we can say that Revelation 14 and the Ninth verse warns us against worshiping in the time of the beast. Do you see that? Whether it's worshiping the beast, whether it's worshiping the image of the beast or the mark of the beast, we can say this is the time of the beast. Do you see that from the Bible? Yes. Well, what is going to take place immediately after the worship of the beast? After the worship of the beast, the Bible tells us, after the, 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 the punishment in verse 14... Notice the next great event in verse 14. What book did I say? Revelation. What chapter? 14. What verse? So it's easy. Revelation 14, verse 14. Let's read that together. The Bible says, And I looked, 
And behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? So the Bible says that immediately after the time of the beast will come Jesus sitting upon the cloud, having on his head a what? Golden crown, and in his hand a what? Sharp sickle. Now what do you do with a sharp sickle? Well, you reap. What do you reap? You reap a harvest. Am I right or wrong? So what time is this that comes after the time of the beast? Look at verse 15. Let's notice the time. Revelation 14 verse 15 now. The Bible says, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap why? For the time. Let's notice the time now. For the time is come for thee to reap. Why? For the harvest of the earth is ripe. So that tells us that immediately after the time of the beast comes the time of the, of the harvest. Did you see that from the Bible? Is that clear? That after the time of the beast comes the time of the harvest. Now, my question is, what is the time of the harvest? Well, the only way we can know what the time of the harvest is, is to understand what is the harvest. So my question is, what is the harvest? Now, it would be foolish to get a man's answer. We want to make sure that the Bible explains itself. Amen? This is the way we study. Let's see if the Bible will tell us what the harvest is. Go to the book of Matthew. The first book of the New Testament. The book of Matthew chapter 13. In the book of Matthew 13, let's see if the Bible will explain to us when the harvest is. Now, you'll notice I didn't mention any of this. I didn't say this. All I'm doing is directing you to what the Bible says. Amen? And the Bible tells us that this is the way to study the Bible. That we study it when we want to learn from the Bible. We must allow the Bible to explain itself. Here a little and there a little precept upon precept, principle upon principle. Spiritual things must be compared with spiritual things. Now, my question is, what is the harvest. Matthew 13. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. And you will notice that Jesus gave a parable in verse 24. That parable was talking about the well-known parable of the wheat and the tares in verse 24. We won't take the time to read that parable tonight, but we want to know the explanation of that parable. They didn't understand what Jesus meant by the wheat and the tares, by the field and the harvest. So Jesus explains beginning in verse 36. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Matthew 13. Beginning in verse 36, let's read that together. The Bible says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away. And went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the what? Of the tares. In other words, they say, we didn't understand the parable. Can you please explain? And Jesus began to explain the parable. In the next verse, verse 37, notice what he says. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the whole. That's the same one that was sitting upon the cloud. The Son of Man is Jesus. In verse 38, it says the field is, what's the next two words? The world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. So the wheat was not talking about some literal plant. It was talking about people. People that have been converted by Jesus Christ. It said that the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the what? But our question is, what is the harvest? In verse 39, let's read the Bible. Verse 39, the Bible explains itself. The Bible says, The enemy that sold them is the devil. The harvest is what? The end of the world. And the reapers are the what? So it's clear that the harvest represents the what? End of the world. And so the Bible says in verses 40, And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be when in the what? In of this world. So the Bible is clear that the harvest represents what? The end of the and the end of the world. So remember now, in symbolic form, Revelation says first the time of the beast and then the time of the harvest. 
But we explain that, and Revelation explains itself, and it says, first, we're going to see the time of the beast, and then we're going to see not only the harvest, but we're going to see the what? The end of the world. So what is the last thing that is going to take place before the world reaches its limit? The mark of the beast. Does it make sense? And so we see that this is the last act in the drama question Who is that beast of Revelation 13? Is the Bible clear? Revelation 13 tells us who the beast is. Turn to Revelation. Revelation chapter 13. The Bible identifies exactly who the beast is. In Revelation 13, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. You see, it's amazing that there are many that do not know who the beast is. In fact, I remember going to one of the stores in the States, and I was coming out of a store called Walmart. And as I was coming out of the store, the persons outside were taking up funds for the unfortunate, some unfortunate children. And so as we came out, we gave them some money, and they gave us some literature, some paper to read, a little tract. And as I turned over to the back of the tract, it says, what is the mark of the beast? And I said, I wonder, that's interesting. So I turned it over, and I looked at the back, and they said that the beast and the mark of the beast is a computer in New York City. Now, if it wasn't so tragic, it might be funny, but, but you know there are people that believe that the mark of the beast is a computer. My brothers and sisters, the devil would love for you to believe that. In fact, what text in the Bible says that the mark of the beast is a computer? Does the Bible say that? No, man has to make that up. If we allow the Bible to explain itself, it's clear what the beast is. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says in Revelation 13, beginning in verses 1. And when you get there, let me know by saying Amen. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, And I stood where? Upon the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his, uh, upon, upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of what? Blasphemy. Now, my brothers and sisters, there are many that are waiting for some literal beast with seven heads to come up up the sand. And they think that you're going to be watching over the sands of Bahamas. And all of a sudden, on the shores of some of your good uh, beach sand, you're going to see a beast. You think some beast is coming up like that? No. No way, my friends. You see, everything in the Bible should be taken literally unless a symbol is introduced. Now, first tell me. Is there any animal in the world that has seven heads and ten horns? This is not a literal animal. That means then it must be a symbolic animal. And we must allow the Bible to explain to us what a beast represents. Does it make sense? Go to the book of Daniel. What book did I say? We'll come right back to Revelation 13. Daniel tells us about the same beast that John the Revelator saw. Daniel and Revelation should be studied together. Daniel chapter 7. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Daniel 7, Daniel was given a vision of beasts rising up out of the sea. In fact, Daniel 7, beginning in verse 3. Daniel 7 verse 3 says, And four great beasts came up from the what? Sea. Diverse from another. And it talked about these beasts. You can read the whole chapter when you get home. But you will notice that Daniel, he's like many of us, he didn't understand what those beasts represent. In fact, you will notice in verse 16, Daniel was troubled about these beasts. I mean, imagine if you had a dream and you saw a beast with seven heads and ten horns. Tell me, how would you feel? I would feel troubled, amen? I would think that you ate too much. What do you say? And so the Bible says in Daniel 7, the Bible says beginning in verse 16, I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me to know the what? So we don't have to interpret. The Bible will interpret and explain itself. Now go to verse 23. What verse did I say? Let's read verse 23. The Bible says in verse 23, Thus he saith, the fourth beast shall be the what? What does the Bible say? That the fourth beast shall be the what? The fourth kingdom. In other words, if the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom, then the third beast will be the 
third king. Then the second beast would be the second king. And the first beast would be the first king. In other words, a beast represents a kingdom. And so when the prophets are watching beasts rise up out of the sea, when it's not a literal beast, these beasts represent powers, kingdoms that affect nations. Does it make sense? Now, my brothers and sisters, let's go back to the book of Revelation. Because you're going to see that Revelation 13, the time of the beast, is going to bring us to a power that is going to control every nation upon the planet. It is going to affect Bahamas. It is going to affect America. It is going to affect every nation upon the globe. The time of the beast. And you need to know what it is. And so the Bible is clear in Revelation 13. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Bible says, I stood upon the sand of the sea, verse 1, and saw a beast. We know that's not now a literal beast. We know it's a prophetic beast. We know it represents a kingdom or a nation, some power in world history. And so the Bible says, this beast had seven heads, ten horns, and ten, uh, ten, and, 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 and ten crowns upon his head, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. Then the Bible tells us all about this beast. Now, my friends, we don't have time to read verse by verse and explain it. So I'm going to give you some identifying marks about this beast so that every one of us in here can know exactly who this beast is. If you know it, it'll just remind you right down the text so you know it for yourself. If you don't know it, then you'll learn it. Amen. Number one, the beast is a world power. What type of power? It is a world power. Now, did I make that up? Does it come from the Bible? Notice Revelation 13, beginning in verse 3, concerning the beast. You will find the identifying marks of the beast from verses 1 through 10. In verses 3, let's read verse 3 together. The Bible says, and I saw what? I saw one of his heads, as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And how much of the world? How much of the world? All the world wondered after the beast. And that tells me, if all of the world are going to wonder after the beast, then all of the world must know who this beast is. It has to be not some local power. It has to be a world power in order for the world to wonder after the beast. Does it make sense? So whoever this political power is, whoever this kingdom is it must be a world power that everyone in the world no matter what nation they are can know what it is number two it power whatever this power is it must be a civil and religious power at the same time is that in the bible yes where in the bible verse 7 revelation 13 in verse 7 the bible says concerning the beast it was given unto him to make war with the what saints and to overcome them and what was given to the beast and power was given him over what all kindreds and tongues and what's that next word and nations now tell me what is the power that rules in nations do we call that political powers or religious power what type of power controls a nation political power or religious power Political power. What type of power controls a nation? We call that civil power. Is this young man all right? Can we get him to sit down? Is all right? So it's a political power. And so a political power is described in Revelation chapter 13. So whoever this power is, it is a world power, but at the same time, it is a civil or political power. Does it make sense? It's the power that controls nation. The power that controls Bahamas is a civil power. But then the Bible says not only would the beast be a civil or a political power, the Bible tells us that at the same time it would be a religious power. How do I know? Verse 8. Look at verse 8. Verse 8. Let's read that together. The Bible says, And all that dwell upon the earth, what's the next word? Shall do what? Worship him. Question. What type of power receives worship? Political power or religious power? When you go to churches, you say you have what? Worship. 
You're having a worship service, so whoever the beast is, it must be at the same time not only a political power, but at the same time it must be a what? A religious power that can receive worship. Now, my brothers and sisters, if we start keep talking, it will be so clear that everyone who doesn't even go to church can tell you who this power is. The Bible is very plain so that we don't misunderstand it. Now, notice, number three, whoever this power is, it would be a blasphemous power. How do I know? Verse five. You remember the first and verse one, it said upon his head will be the names of blasphemy. But notice now verse five, Revelation 13, verse five. The Bible says, and there was given unto him a what? A mouth. What did he do with that mouth? Speaking great things and what? And blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 42 months. So the Bible tells us that whoever this beast is, that it would speak, what's the next word? It would speak what? Blasphemy. Question, what is blasphemy? Now we want the Bible to tell us what blasphemy is, all right? The Bible tells us that blasphemy represents two things. Go to the book of John. What book did I say? To the Gospel of John, chapter 10. To the Gospel of John, chapter 10. And let's let the Bible tell us itself because the beast, the Bible says, would speak blasphemy. This beast's power will be a world power. It will be a civil and religious power. At the same time, it will be a power that would speak blasphemy. What does it mean to speak blasphemy? I don't want to tell you. I want the Bible to explain itself. I didn't tell you. The Bible is going to tell you. In fact, I'm going to let you tell me from your Bible what blasphemy is. Amen? John chapter 10, beginning in verse 33, the Bible interprets itself. It's very simple. In verse 33, let's read that together. The Bible says, The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for what? Now, we want to know what blasphemy is. For blasphemy. And because that thou being what? A man does what? Makest thyself God. So what is blasphemy? Blasphemy is a man that does what? Who maketh himself God. Or a man who claims to be God. So whoever the beast is, it must have in it a man who claims to be God. But my brothers and sisters, the Bible says, not only is blasphemy a man who claims to be God, but the Bible says that blasphemy is something else. Go to the book of Luke. What book did I say? In fact, go to the book of Mark, just before Luke. Go to the book of Mark chapter 2. To the book of Mark chapter 2, and let's let the Bible tell us what it means to speak blasphemy. Now notice, the Bible is going to tell you what blasphemy is. You don't have to make it up. You just simply have to read the Bible and believe what the Bible teaches. The Bible says in Mark chapter 2. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Mark chapter 2, the Bible says, Not only is blasphemy a man who claims to be God, but the Bible tells us in Mark 2, beginning in verse 7, let's see what blasphemy is. Let's let the Bible explain itself. Let's read together. What does the Bible say? The Bible says... Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? What does it mean? Who can forgive sins but what? So the Bible says that a man who claims to forgive sin is speaking what? Did I say it or did the Bible say it? So the Bible says that whoever this beast power is, it must be a world power. It must be a civil and religious power at the same time. It must be a power who has in it a man who claims to be God and a man who claims to forgive sin. Now, there are many more identifying marks, but I believe that just with this, that anyone who knows world affairs, even a child, can tell you who this power is. Now, my brothers and sisters, it talks about the daily wound that will be healed. Revelation 13.3 tells us that. Talked about it ruling the world for 1260 years. From 538 to 798, persecuting Christians, persecuting the people of God. The Bible tells us, and my friends, there's only one power in all the world that meets this specification. Only one power that is a world power. That is a civil and religious power. At the same time, that is a political power. 
that is at the same time a power that has in it a man who claims to be God and to forgive sins that has persecuted the people of God. And that power is none other than the Roman Catholic church system. Now, don't misunderstand me. Listen to me. Don't misunderstand me. That does not mean that there are not Christians in the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, we're told that the majority of true Christians are in the Catholic Church and many other churches. True Christians in the Catholic Church. And I have seen that when those true Christians have studied the Bible for themselves, I've seen priests, I've seen nuns, I've seen leaders in the Catholic Church and members of the Catholic Church who love God and Jesus Christ and who believe the Bible and when they read it for themselves and they see the identifying marks, they say, I never knew that we were talked about in the Bible. And then they come out of Babylon. They come out of that church and they take their stand with the remnant church of God. But let me tell you something. Listen. How in the world can the other Christians hear if some Christians are afraid to teach what we believe? My brothers and sisters, there are many Christians. I will never forget, just a few months ago we were doing meetings and a man who had never heard this before was a faithful Catholic and he came and heard this for the first time and he said, listen, I've never heard it before but everything was from the word of God. He says, I love God above my church. I love Jesus above the Pope. He said, I love him and whatever God says, I'm going to follow. And I believe there are some Christians here tonight and all listening through the radio, through the waves that say, I want to follow Jesus wherever he leads. Now my friends, you will see very clearly that while there are many Christians in the Catholic Church that the system is of the devil. There's only one system that has in it a man who claims to be God, a man who claims to be against sin. In fact, this man's name is called Papa, Pope. Comes from the Latin word Papa, it means Father. When people address him, they call him Holy Father. But the Bible says in Matthew 23, verse 8, Call no man Father, but your Father which is in heaven. My brothers and sisters, this power, at the same time, do you know what this says? Listen, I'm going to let you read from a Catholic historian. I didn't say it. This is what Rome says. It says, to make war with the Pope is to make war against God. Seeing as the Pope is God and God is the Pope, this is blasphemy. This is Antichrist. This is the man of sin and the world has been hypnotized. He's gone all around the world and America and the nations have bowed and kissed his ring and bowed at his knees. The world is wondering after the beast who will give the trumpet a certain sound. You listen to me, brothers and sisters, because this was the time of the beast. But the Bible says this beast will receive a deadly wound. And at the end of time, this beast is going to come back. His wound will be healed. Now, my brothers and sisters, this power has a confessional. It is the Roman Catholic Church that have priests that claim that they can forgive sin. That you can go into these confessionals. And if you have sins, you can get them as all. I'll never forget reading the story about an old lady that was getting ready to die. She was at one of the hospitals and she was at the last moments of her life and she was on her deathbed. And so as the doctors knew that this woman was getting ready to die, they said, send in for the chaplain. And the chaplain that was on duty in the hospital was a Roman Catholic priest. And the priest came in. He saw the woman getting ready to die and losing her breath and gasping for air, trying to hold on to life. And he said to her, is it well with your soul? Are you ready to die? Has your sins been forgiven? Have your sins been washed away? Have you been absolved? Have you, have you been forgiven? Are you ready to be with the Savior? Are you ready to rest in the grave awaiting the, the life giver? And that woman said, she says, you know, I'm getting ready to die. I can never be too sure. I want to make sure that all my sins are forgiven. And He says then, he says, don't worry, I'm a priest. I can absolve your sins. And she said, let me see your hands. And the priest came over to her. And the priest gave her her hands. And the woman felt his hands. And she said, ah, you are an imposter. She said, the only one that can forgive sins has no prince in his hands. 
You see, Jesus died to forgive us our sins, and the only power that will give him the ability to forgive sins is to die in our place. And there's only one man that has died on the cross for us, and that man is Jesus. And to say that you can forgive sin is blasphemy. To say that a man can forgive sin makes him antichrist. So, my brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us that this is the Roman Catholic Church. Many Christians that have never studied this, but it's there, and the world believes it. Look at what this says. It says, the Catholic Church said this in their own paper. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of the flesh. Blasphemy. And it's time that our eyes open up so that we can turn away from man and turn to Jesus. Somebody says, oh, that was a long time ago, but even, this is a Time magazine from 1981. Here a Jewish man said that shooting the Pope is like shooting God. Jewish man. Now, my brothers and sisters, if Rome is the beast, the Catholic Church, then what is the mark of the beast? Because the mark of the beast would be the mark of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm going to let Rome tell you what her mark is. Rome knows better than anyone else. Let's let Rome tell us. Because this is going to take place just before the world comes to an end. Rome says, and this is in the book Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. Anyone who's listening knows that when a Catholic is converted to become a Catholic, that there is a book called the Converts Catechism that teaches its converts what they believe. I have one myself. This is what it says. Question. Which is the Sabbath day? Answer. Saturday is the Sabbath day. This is what Rome says. Question. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, this is history, A.D. 364 transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Who gave Rome the authority to change the commandments of God? Who gave Rome the authority to take her puny hands and put it into the law of the living God? The Bible says this power, the little horn, would think to change times and laws, but it's blasphemy. My friends... This is the third edition. I have the newest edition. It's still there. Same thing. Sunday. This is from 1990. Catholic Press. I didn't say it. Rome says herself. Her own lips. 1990. Look at what Rome says. Sunday is a what? Catholic institution. Do you know that other Protestants don't know this? The Anglican Church don't know this. The Baptist Church don't know this. The rest of the churches think that Sunday is in the Bible and don't know that it came from Rome. This says... 1990, Rome, Sunday, is a Catholic institution. And its claim to observance can be defended only on what? You know what it is? Because a Catholic believes in tradition above the Bible. That's, that's part of the belief. To believe in the words of the, uh, of the apostles, uh, the words of tradition, the elders above the Bible. But a Protestant believes in the Bible above the words of men. That's the Christian position. Now, my brothers and sisters, listen to what Rome says. Rome knows from beginning to the end of Scripture. In other words, Rome says from Genesis to Revelation, there is not a what? Single passage that warrants the transfer of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. Rome knows it. And then notice what she says. Catholic records. Sunday is our mark of authority. It says the church is above the Bible. That's why Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the church of Wittenberg. That's why the Protestant Reformation started out. That's why you have a Baptist church. That's why you have an Anglican church. Because of the Protestant Reformation. But we have forgotten our roots. Our roots as Protestants is not in tradition. It's in the Bible. And my brothers and sisters, this says that Sunday is a Catholic institution. That Sunday worship is the mark of the beast 
or the mark of Rome. And Christians don't know it today. Does anyone have the mark of the beast? Oh, no. In ignorance, God winks at it. But do you know we're told that that beast power is getting ready to come back? And I wanted to tell you when it was coming back tonight, but my time has gotten away from me. I know you're ready to go home. My brothers and sisters, listen. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to get ready to close. Look, look, watch now. This says that the time of the beast, that the time of Rome would come just before the harvest, just before the world comes to an end. So the Bible says that Sunday worship would be brought back to show us that the limit had been reached. And when that law is passed, do you know it's going to bring Seventh-day Adventists to the test first? You see, there are Christians in the Roman Catholic Church. There are Christians in the Baptist Church. There are Christians in the Anglican Church. There are Christians in the Church of God and in the Methodists that have never studied this for themselves. They love God. They love Jesus. God does not condemn them. They're living and loving God to all the knowledge that they have, but they've never seen from themselves what the Bible teaches. But seven Adventists have had this for years, and seven Adventists are not doing the work that they should be doing on this island. Let me tell you something. Do you know who the first prime minister was on Bahamas? You tell me who the first prime minister was. What was his name? Tell, this is history. Do you know that the, your first prime minister died believing in the seventh day Sabbath? And if your prime minister used to believe it, I believe you ought to believe it. If your old prime minister that brought liberation to this country, I believe that you ought to believe what's in the Bible. Know the history. My friends, the truth is the truth. And I believe that God is going to have some people that are not going to do what the world is doing because, listen, but you know what? While they're Christians in these other denominations that don't know this, do you know that Seventh-day Adventists have been knowing this and many Seventh-day Adventists are still not keeping the Sabbath holy? Find themselves trying to fry, fry fish when the sun is setting on Friday. At the market somewhere when the sun is setting, trying to hold the sun up and you know what the Sabbath is. God is upset and angered at a generation of seven Adventists that have all this light and are doing nothing with it. They allow the messages to flood the way that everything's all right and God is saying, wake up seven Adventists. You know why? Because God wants to use you as a messenger to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people to let the world and all of our brothers and sisters know that Jesus is coming. My brothers and sisters, listen. This says, the Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. For it is to be the what? A great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. Do you know when the image of the beast is formed and the Sunday law is passed? Do you know that every person who knows what day is the Sabbath is going to be brought to the test whether they obey God or whether they obey man? And my brothers and sisters, do you know that you can't get the mark of the beast so that you can buy and sell? You can't get the mark of the beast so that you can eat and not be persecuted and then go home and wash it off with soap. If you get the mark of the beast, it is an eternal decision. So when that Sunday law is passed, those who know better, and you go along with that power, at that time, the line of demarcation will be drawn, and the battle will have been set. Either you're ready for God, or you are. And my brothers and sisters, that Sunday law is getting ready to pass right now. It's everywhere in the world. My brothers and sisters, this, said, this is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. All who prove their loyalty to God, by observing his law, it says, let me just get some power. I think we all need power, amen? It's all right to get a little power. But it says, you know how you know when the devil's afraid, amen? Amen. It's all right. We'll just take our time. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. All will prove their loyalty to God 
by observing His law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath, will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah. In other words, when you believe the Bible Sabbath, when you believe the Sabbath of creation, when you believe in the seven-day Sabbath and you look like Jesus and stand for Him because you love Him, for He who loves me, He says, keeps my commandment. It says, these will receive the seal of the what? Living God. But those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath, the Sabbath of tradition, the one that came from Rome, will receive the what? Mark of the beast. Now the world doesn't know that, but God is trying to raise up seven Adventists that will preach the message all the way around the world so that every church would hear the loud cry and understand for themselves what day belongs to Jehovah. And my brothers and my sisters, when that Sunday law is passed, the test is coming. It's going to be just like a sponge. All of us are just like sponges. You take a sponge and you put it in water and you squeeze it. What comes out of that sponge? Water. You take a sponge and you put it in grape juice and you squeeze it. What comes out of the sponge? You take that sponge and you put it in orange juice and you squeeze it. What comes out of that sponge? You and I are just like sponges. The national Sunday law is the squeeze with its pressure and persecution and only what is in us can come out of us. And if Jesus is not in us, then Jesus cannot come out of us. And so Christ, not knocking at our hearts, but Christ in us is the hope of glory. We must get Jesus completely in us by the passing of the Sunday law so that when we're pressed by persecution, you and I will come to the place where only Jesus comes out of us. And do you know that God gives us tests today? And when we get something goes wrong in our house and something slips out of our mouth that should never have come out. That when we start thinking the wrong things, when men start looking at the wrong things on the television or the internet, when mind becomes polluted, when man picks up things that he shouldn't, we're told that all of this is, is revealing that Christ is not in him. And let me ask you a question. If I take that sponge and I keep it squeezed, what else can come into that sponge? Nothing else. The only thing I can get something into that sponge is that I must release the pressure. But from the time that the sunny law is passed to the coming of Jesus, the pressure will not be released. It's going to get more tense and more tense and more tense. And so that tells us that the only time we can get Jesus in us is before the pressure, before the persecution, before the storm breaks. And the only time we can do that is now. And this is why God brought these meetings here, because listen to me. This is getting ready to take place right now. Revelation says that this power will receive a deadly wound. Did Rome receive a deadly wound? Revelation 13 verse 3 says it will receive a deadly wound. Now let me let, you let, me let the Catholic encyclopedia tell you when Rome received her deadly wound. In the Catholic encyclopedia. It says, this is history. The temporal sovereignty of the Pope, that means it's political power, ended during the what? Do you know that you can go into any encyclopedia and put this in and you will find out this is history? That it lost its political power in 1798. Notice what it says now. The French Revolution, when the French army captured Rome in what year? In 1798. He was put in prison, the Pope, exile. Now my brothers and sisters, that was the beginning of the deadly wound. But the Bible says that it will receive a deadly wound but then the Bible says in verse 3, and his daily wound will be what? Healed. And how much of the world? And all of the world would wonder after the beast. I'm going to show you that that wound is almost healed. I'm going to show you that the last pope that died, that presidents kneel before his tomb and bow to that former pope and the present pope. Oh, my brothers and sisters, you better know something is getting ready to happen. I wonder, has the pope ever visited Bahamas? Oh, yes. 1979. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something is getting ready to happen into Bahamas right now. Oh, I can't wait to show it. I wish I could just tell you all tonight. You're in danger right here. 
Something is getting ready to take place more severe. When that wound is healed, political power will be given back to Rome and persecution will begin afresh. And man has no clue that when this power changes, you know it's going to unite with the United States of America. We're told this is getting ready to take place. So listen, when we come back tomorrow, we're going to pick up quick. We're going to show you how is America's come in. We're going to show you what's going to take place. And we're going to show you why in 2008 something happened in the world and Bahamas that proved that this generation shall not pass. That this is the one that is going to witness all of these things. And do you know that everything is ready for this final crisis but you and I? And so God says, please, don't, don't let the Sunday law pass in America and in Bahamas. Because let me tell you something, I'm going to show you tomorrow, Bahamas is going to be one of the first countries that goes along with America. And you know it, you tell me, where do you get all your food from? Tell me, where do your tourists come from? I'm going to tell you something. You are tied to America and you can't get loose. And let me tell you something, it's dangerous. If you won't go along with America... What do you think is going to happen to your supply of food? You're in danger. God has given us a message to prepare. And I'm going to show you by God's grace what the Bible says of how you and I can be prepared for that time. Right here. I'm going to show you by God's grace how we can come to Jesus. Because when this takes place, the whole world is going to wonder after the beast. And right now it's going to take place. In fact, do you know what the Pope, present Pope's name is? Benedict the 16th. That's not his real name. You know his real name is Joseph Ratzinger. But you know that when a cardinal becomes a pope, they go into a conclave. And in that conclave, the Pope, before he chooses his pontificate, he's supposed to choose a name that's supposed to characterize what he's going to do when he takes office. And so he said he was praying there, and he said the name was placed into his mind, Benedict the 16th. Now I want to ask you a question. The first part of benediction, is that Benedict? Benediction. Now a benediction. Does that come at the beginning of a program or at the end of a program? My brothers and sisters, the, the, the Pope Benedict the 16th is the benediction Pope. This is the Pope of the end of the last generation. We're here! And the question tonight is, do you want to be ready to meet Jesus? Do you want to be ready? Can you tell me what is more important than these meetings to get ready? What is more important than getting to know Jesus? What is more important than getting others to know it? We must work for the night is coming. What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? Can you imagine this? Do you know that when the Sunday launch pass, that every young person, every adult is going to wake up, their jobs are going to lose significance, their school is going to lose significance, the world, its music, lose significance. Beyonce, who is that? The only thing that is going to matter is that you know Jesus. And tonight, do you know it's not too late? You can come to Jesus tonight. And there's help. I wonder if there's someone here tonight that says, Lord, I want Jesus in my heart. If there's someone like that here tonight, would you reverently join me as we pray tonight as we close? Heavenly Father, we want Jesus in our hearts. The truth is clear from the Bible. Sometimes the truth hurts. Sometimes the truth cuts, but the truth is always the truth. And you've given us the truth to make us free. And if we love you, Lord, we're going to listen not to the commandments of men. We're going to listen to the commandments of God. And I plead tonight that you will give us the strength those that are listening for the first time, those that are hearing this again, that you will show us, Lord, that time is not going to continue. There is a limit, and that limit is almost reached tonight, and in Bahamas, we are in trouble. I plead that you will agitate us, Lord. Don't let us rest. May we go home tonight, not talking outside, but may we go home pleading with God to give us just a little more time to get to know you. 
Give us a little more time to talk to our friends and family that have never studied this for themselves, to study like we've never studied before, to pray like we never prayed before, that we may be prepared for the coming storm. Lord, we want this experience tonight. We want to know you. Lord, we've messed up so many times. But we're so thankful that there's blood that comes from Jesus that can cleanse us from all sin. And so I pause the prayer. If there's someone here tonight that says, Lord, I want to come to Jesus. Lord, I want to be able to stand in this last hour. I want your strength. Then raise your hand right where you are. Forget about everybody else in this congregation. Your hands are bowed. Your eyes are closed. And you're raising your hand by saying, Lord, I want the strength to stand. Because without me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. And you want to be ready to meet Jesus. Just raise your hand wherever you are. Praise God. Heavenly Father, you see the lifted hands. Please. Give them strength. Give them a new experience. Give us that relationship with Jesus where we may stand despite what the world does. And if there were any on the radio, on the television, anywhere else that's here in this room tonight that should have lifted their hand but didn't, I plead that you will not let them rest until they make a full surrender to Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will keep us tonight. We know the devil, after he's taught us this, would love to kill us before we can make our decision. But send forth angels that excel in strength. Send us home safely and bring us back safely tomorrow evening, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.